Hello, everyone. Welcome to the On.net live show. We are our 16 minutes of unscripted entertainment. It's Monday. We're live. Our mission here is to empower the .NET community to achieve more. I'm your host, Maya Wenzel, with my co-host, David, and Hello. special co-host, Re Ruben. Since hey, we everyone. have... <laughs> We have a special guest today who's going to be talking about Microsoft Orlean. So, Vincent, I don't want to mess up your last name. So, Hugo Dorn? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. <laughs> so, how about you introduce yourself? Yes. Well, uh, I'm Vincent Hogendorn. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP developer technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been, been active as a, a hands on. Uh, .NET engineer for well almost as long as .NET exists. Well, a little bit shorter, like 22 years now, I think. Yeah. So um, um, I'm an independent uh, software engineer, and uh, I'm also uh, at the moment working as a uh, tec technical director at uh, a company called Applicita. And um, well, my my passion has always been basically to improve the developer experience for .NET developers. And uh, well, in the recent, the, the last couple of years, I've been focusing on uh, doing that for uh, uh, for a full stack C-sharp approach, which uh, means uh, using Microsoft or Lynx uh, for scalable backends and uh, using C-sharp markup for frontends. And uh, it's the first part that I've uh, created, well, quite a bit of open source libraries for in the last year. And, uh, well, I hope other people uh, can benefit from those things. So I'm very uh, pleased to be able to share it today with you. Awesome. We're happy that yeah. you're here to share your knowledge. And that's what the show is about, is sharing everything that the community has been doing with their projects and their passions and, and teaching folks around the world what they can achieve with Donna. So that's awesome. Do you want us to share your uh, your screen? Yes, please. There we go. Thank okay. you, David. So, uh, well, let's uh, let's start. So you've already heard the title uh, with a nice uh, big uh, image uh, generated uh, background to go with it. So we've already talked about this. Uh, you can look me up on on GitHub if you want to. Uh, most of my open source libraries are there. Um, but the real stuff that I would like to talk about is, well, I've, I've decided to go for uh, the form of a story, really, because it's really a, a learning journey for me. And it started a couple of years ago and when I had uh, a big project, and that's what I call the learning case here. And that's when I came to use Microsoft Orleans uh, in that specific way for the first time in the specific way that I would like to share uh, today. And after I had done that, I actually discovered that I um, had applied a law that I wasn't aware about, which is called Conway's law. And so I will tell a little bit about that and specifically how you apply that when you build microservices backends, so scalable microservices uh, solutions and um, how that combines with using modular monoliths. And then um, all that learning has resulted in an open source library, which is called Orleans.multisurface on GitHub. Um, and it will demonstrate how, um, how you can quickly create such a modular monolith and also how you can extract a microservice at a later point from that monolith without having to rewrite your backend code. And uh, that's basically the story I'm about to tell. So, uh, well, uh, let's start. And please interrupt me if there are any questions. So uh, I can always answer. I'm happy to answer them. So. Sounds good. Here it goes. OK. So the, uh, the screenshot in the lower part is a bit fuzzy because I had to take it out of, uh, of a video. The original material was lost. But uh, no worries. I'm not going to talk about all these details. This is the learning case. So the learning case was a couple of years ago, I was a lead architect uh, for a company in the communication domain. And they asked me to 
to take uh, a technical solution, a microservices solution from a company that they bought. And they wanted to use that as a stepping stone to bring their own main product um, up to the latest uh, cloud capabilities in terms of scalability and reliability. So basically, I had this mission of, uh, on the one hand, using an existing Kubernetes microservices architecture with Azure Kubernetes service, with um, two teams who were, had already built like 15 microservices. It had run for like four years, many customers. So it was a, a SaaS solution. Uh, it had many concurrent users. And on the other hand, I had a really big monolith built in-house, not, not built for the cloud, um, with like eight years of very complex functionality. And my, well, interesting, challenging mission was to bring those two things together to basically bring that missing functionality from the monolith into the cloud age and make it really scalable. So naturally, uh, the initial approach was, well, let's look at what we have. And what you can see here on the left-hand side is uh, a database, which so basically a traditional microservices way to, to scale uh, application. So you have a database and you have some services. I, I call it service A here. Um, and you have a number of instances uh, to scale out. And uh, if it's a stateful service, then um, you can, for example, use a PubSub mechanism to make sure that the state is uh, in sync uh, and uh, is saved in a reliable way. So that's basically a, a really traditional microservices architecture. And um, the question that I faced together with the team that I was adding, so there was one more team coming in. So okay, let's 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 uh, use this. These guys know what they're doing. Let's just do more in the same way. Let's just uh, port our monolith code to these microservices uh, in this microservices architecture that they have been running so successfully. And we did that for a first microservice. And then we realized, well, OK, this is actually quite a lot of work. Um, I'm not sure how many of you really love YAML, but there was quite a lot of YAML involved. <laughs> uh, <I love> so <laughs> some people are not really keen on YAML. I can understand that. <laughs> I don't want to diss it either, but, but I can understand it. Uh, but there was a lot of YAML, too. And there were people yammering about YAML. Um, well, OK, that's one thing. But then there's other stuff. Like in the existing um, microservices approach, uh, whether your service had state, was stateful or not uh, had big consequences. So they tried to avoid creating stateful services. But sometimes you don't have a choice, and you have to make it stateful. And then I mean not just transient state, but also persistent state. So, and quickly it became apparent that most of the functionality we had to add was actually stateful. And then in that case, you have to do extra work, extra thinking work, extra development work, extra testing work, extra infrastructure work. You know, have to add Redis. Um, you have to think really good about concurrency. So that means carefully reasoning about the code in those stateless services or stateful services and review that and add tests for that. And that's all just for one microservice, right? So that's that's quite a lot of extra work when you compare the actual functionality that you want to add. So at this point, we said, OK, we get this working. We get this working with the experienced Kubernetes and DevOps people in the other teams. So no problem. We can do this. But at the granularity that microservices are usually defined, we need to add many, many more services. And we are a single team. So do we really want to? And this was the, the key question where my learning journey started and where Orleans came into the picture. The question was, do we really need to multiply this overhead by adding many, many more microservices? Why? So, and I put a 
sort of, well, uh, uh, face with a, a sweaty face uh, on there to indicate that people were seeing a lot of hard work coming and they are wondering, well, is that really necessary? So without going into all the details, um, I will share the, the link of the video where this is from uh, later on, but without going into all these details, um, I had knowledge of Microsoft Orleans. And I thought, what if we could use that to simplify service development? And then for those people who are not really familiar with Microsoft Tool, it's a very short introduction, right? So the way that I describe it, so these are just, just my words, my way to explain it. But Microsoft Tool to me is a mature SDK for you know, building distributed .NET applications. And um, I'm also, um, used to thinking about it as cloud native objects for C sharp, which basically means that you have the productivity of you know object oriented development in C sharp, and it's very very similar to that, but then actually in the cloud. Um, and the main well advantages are developer productivity, um, and this is the biggest one transparent scalability by default. And uh, when you uh, look at Microsoft Orleans from the core concepts, then you see on the left hand in the blue area, there's a, what's called a grain, but basically in C sharp terms, this is just uh, an implementation class. So for example, uh, a user that implements an interface called iUser and that inherits from the grain base class. But what this really is, is it encapsulates logic and state and it has a kind of contract which is network addressable and it has an identity. And all this together to me, which is not a scientific correct term, but I tend to think in, uh, about it as another term, which is sort of very, very small services. So a grain is a really, really small service. I call it nano services. But this is due to the fact that it's addressable over uh, the network. And actually your iUser interface is just the same as, uh, well, basically uh, uh, a service interface. Uh, so if so, we're, if we're uh, yeah. giving things names, maybe we could say it's like a grain service because it's the size of a grain. Yeah, it's very <laughs> small. Yeah, and, and this is basically the power of why things are so, well, it sometimes seems a bit deceptively simple, but this is just a consequence of making things very small. So um, those grains are small. They are classes, you know, you shouldn't make classes really, really big, but they are classes. Everybody has some sort of understanding on how much to put in a class. Um, but a very big advantage is you don't need to make the code stateless because the whole complexity of persisting that state, keeping it either in memory or in, for example, table storage or a database, that's all handled with a few settings at a very high level of Orleans itself. So you can have many, many of these very small services, print services, um, without increasing the complexity of your infrastructure that remains the same. So all that overhead from the previous slide, that doesn't grow when you add more grains and it also doesn't grow and that's the right hand uh, image. So the real scalability of course comes still from, you know, adding more machines. So either uh, physical machines or uh, uh, just using containers with Kubernetes. Um, those are, so the grains are together in a silo but you can think of silos as a kind of machine. So that's your scalability thing. And the, the whole thing is the picture on the right, when you are developing and when you are configuring your infrastructure, you don't need to do a lot. It's, it's obviously, it's, it's transparent. Really. So all this together, and there's much more to Orleans, you can see the link on the bottom, but all this together to me seems like an answer to how can I reduce the overhead of making scalable backends? The overhead of having to reason about um, uh, all that infrastructure to try to avoid being stateful. And um, well, there's one other thing that's not in this slide, but 
the, the runtime model of those grains is single threaded. So this means you can, you don't have to make your code uh, thread safe. And that's also a big reasoning uh, safe that you don't have to do. So this is about, you know, Orleans making things really, really simple while still, you know, being able to make a mature scalable uh, distributed application. Now there's more into Orleans, but uh, I don't want to go into all the th things because uh, I have one focus point to get to. So you can also have streams and distributed transactions and event sourcing, but that's, uh, yeah. So um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping uh, Robin isn't uh, uh, offended by anything I'm <laughs> leaving out or saying wrong, but uh, this is not at all. My simple actually, way of, of wording it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Actually, the term uh, nano services I think is pretty apt. I, I think the first time I heard microservices used originally was actually in the context of actors, um, and at the time I was looking at ACA, um, like the JVM version of ACA. Um, but they might have even characterized them as nano or pico services at that time as well. I, I think it. I think it fits well. Yeah, in my experience, and it's uh, clearer than than calling uh, the actor terminology that confuses people sometimes. Yes, for sure. Yeah, we tend to shy away from calling grains actors these days. That's why you see that cloud native objects terminology. I think it's just a lot more clear. Um, mm. People tend to conflate actors with ACA actors, and they're not the same. Or like like with classic uh, 1972 Carl Hewitt actors or or Erlang actors, and and really the difference is is pretty clear once you start using Orleans, that actually the the framework is not about actors. It's all about objects, and and really more uh, more broadly, it's about productivity in the cloud, right? Yeah, and I think that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and I think that ties in well with Andrew's question about. Could you talk about when we should use Microsoft Orleans and Aka Donut? And um and Aka Donut is the like we already had Aaron on our show as well and like talking about the actor uh framework uh model. Um so can you talk a little bit about that, uh, Ruben or Vincent? I'd like to give this one to Ruben uh, because <laughs> not the focus point of my uh of my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so trying to decide when to use one or the other is, is really a, a personal question. Um, I would say generally give both a shot and decide what you, you know, prefer. Um, but the, there is a, a pretty significant difference in terms of what we would call the programming model between a grain and an actor. Um, and I think the way that Aaron actually described it at one point was that um, Orleans is more like an automatic car, whereas... Uh, Acker is more like manual transmission. That's not really quite an accurate thing, but it's one way of characterizing the difference. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, in Orleans, the life cycle of your objects, these grains or actors in Acker terminology, is managed by the runtime. And so in Orleans, you say, I want to talk to user slash jnapemail.com, for example. And the, the framework will go and say, all right, well, does that user exist somewhere in the cluster of, of machines right now? And if not, we will activate it and make sure it's available for you to use, and then we'll route all your messages to it. So from your perspective, it really is just like you're calling into services via interfaces, um, and they're strongly typed and everything, and you just have async await type semantics. Um, but the underlying uh, system actually does all of this allocation and routing and, and lifecycle management for you. It's a little bit different in ACO, which is more um, message-oriented and is, is more faithful to the original um, actor model. Mm -hmm. uh, as specified by Carl Hewitt back in the early 70s. And uh, yes. I, I initially assumed this question was slightly different in that it was maybe asking not to compare the two, but like when to use this type of programming model at all. Like, you know, wh when is when would it be applicable to use oh. Orleans or when would it be applicable to use ACA, you know, regardless uh, of which so actor no, model so implementation. No. So not one versus the other, but like just when yeah. you need this to be. Yeah. When is it important to use this type of programming model? Okay. Either, <laughs> either one. Um, I would say if you're building distributed applications, um, then they generally provide some utility to you. So they're generally useful anytime you're building for the cloud. Um, and that goes for both of them. I think Acker itself also shines when you're also doing a lot of local concurrency and you want to use actors as a concurrency building block. 
um, even in the non-distributed sense. But all leans is more designed specifically for when you want something that's cloud native and you want to scale out and you know you you want that kind of a, that kind of style of programming. There's space and love for it? everyone. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Sure. So, but yeah, and I did uh, um, investigate this question, at least which one to choose and, and whether it would fit uh, at the start of that uh, project that I described in, in previous slide. Yeah. And um, one of the things that counted for me was that um, Orleans is specifically designed to be very er easy to learn for, um, you know, the, the mainstream, the common uh, C-sharp developers. So it's very close to the paradigm of just OO development. Um, and it still allows you to go very deep into the specifics uh, of distributed applications, but it doesn't throw you at, in your face right at the start. So you can start quickly and then become more advanced without being blocked, while ACA, from my understanding, more requires you to have a, a a lot more deep understanding of distributed applications to start out. You have a steeper learning curve, so to say. So that's also a difference. Sure. Um, but perhaps um, I'm not sure if the question is answered. Uh, yeah, I think okay. that makes sense. We, we did have another question right away. So Mario is asking, mm -hmm. is there a grain limit to a silo? Mm, uh, well, theoretically there is, but <laughs> it's, it's huge, I imagine. Not something to worry about. I'm yeah, sure so Robin knows the most numbers, but sure thing. Yeah, so there's no there's no fixed limit. Generally speaking, you can think of of a couple of different limits that that come into play. So one is, um, first of all, it's good to think of grains kind of like virtual memory. The, the silo sort of brings these things into memory when they're needed, while they're needed, and then eventually they'll be idle and they'll be effectively like paged out to disk, right? As in their state is stored in some database somewhere, and we can just evict them um, and to you as the programmer, that's completely transparent because the next time you need it, Orleans will make sure that it's available again for you. Um, so what you really what you really end up asking is how many grains can we have in memory at any point in time? And the answer is, well, how much memory do you have? Typically, the overhead of a of a grain is not that big, um, so so that's pretty much your limit there. And then the second question is, uh, you know, the second part of this might be how many can we have actively doing things at any one point in time? Um, and the answer for that is, um, Vincent mentioned earlier that grains are effectively single-threaded. Uh, a, a lot of people take that to mean, okay, we have a thread per grain. Well, that's not the case. Actually, the way it works is Orlean schedules these grains on the .NET thread pool, and then they execute their work, and then you know they're idle. So grains don't use any CPU while they're not doing anything. Uh, but while they're active, they just get scheduled like any regular task or, or any regular work item into the .NET thread pool. So I guess the answer is how much CPU do you have really? So uh, Orlean scales very well vertically uh, with your application. So you can run large machines and it will scale well, just like .NET does in general. Hopefully that answers it. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Well, so uh, let's quickly revisit then how this applies to the situation of a microservices architecture uh, that you want to extend. Uh, so revisiting uh, what we uh, saw in the previous slide. So this is still the same slide we saw, right? So we have this pattern on the left, which we could extend, but then ex we have to accept all the overhead that we discussed. Perhaps we can do something different. And that's what this is. So on the right hand side, you now see a big block with uh, the grain uh, and uh, as a foundation. And what you see uh, in there is a boundary that is a microservice that hosts cloud native objects. So Microsoft Orleans microservice. And effectively with all these grains in there, um, I've drawn very small database icons with instant state in them. But basically, you can see that it's basically a box, conceptually, a big box of nano services. They're all network addressable. So this means that we could conceptually use a single box to host an enormous amount of nano services. Now, there's a gap to bridge here because we have 
microservices and conceptually nanoservices. So how do we get to the same level of granularity? And that's basically um, done by putting them in separate namespaces and then guarding those namespaces with, in that time, recently, I did that with Visual Studio dependency diagrams. So you can, you know, can sketch the allowed dependencies between assemblies and namespaces in there. And on build, it will validate that you will not get into a really big ball of, of spaghetti code. Because that's the fear, of course, if you put a lot of logic into a single set of a single solution or single service, how do you prevent it becoming entangled? And that's where I use the dependency diagrams. Now I've moved on from that to a uh, more powerful solution and uh, more uh, with a lower barrier to entry. But the whole idea was, and this is basically where I got to the, the, the core pattern that's now been modernized and shared as an open source uh, library which uh, is, well, you have a big service, you put it just into a microservice architecture like any other service. The only difference is it has uh, uh, a separate API. So in it, a really an REST API, for example, that simply uh, exposes the operations of a logical service, which is just a part of the only service. And when I think about the granularity of releases, um, if you have a lot of those, those services, logical services that are all in that same box, then the load of those services is not in very big chunks, to, but it's, it's basically um, uh, all those little grains, so those nano services, they are spread out across the silos and if you have like 10 logical services, then you have a really optimal spread of what your actual usage is. So what I'm trying to say here is the whole complexity of trying to determine how many instances do I need of service A? And how many instances do I need of service B within my entire given infrastructure to have it you know, function optimally? Um, that whole thinking about it and arranging about it, that sort of disappears because those grains, they come and go as they are needed and they use a really big pool of machines and they are distributed. So that's a nice uh, effect of those the smaller granularity. Well, the end of the, it was that this worked. This worked great. The, the team was very productive. Um, no pain I put on the top uh, right no pain, all those pains sort of disappeared. And we still had full interop uh, between traditional microservices and this one, uh, both ways. So, well, great. Um, so I learned something. And then I, later on, I discovered that what I had discovered was actually, uh, well, well known for a long time. And it was called Conway's Law. Because basically, if you recall, I had three teams, and the original two teams had 15 microservices. And the new team had a choice. Are we going to build a lot of microservices or not? And we chose to build one service with our leads that had a lot of logical services in them. And then Conway's Law, which was basically as old as I am. I'm, I'm born in 1967, so that's my age. Right. So Conway in 1967 already said, well, look, if you look at how software is built and organized, it's not so much a function of uh, the, what, what uh, the logical requirements are of what the software must do. It's a function of how the developers are organized. So if there's three teams spread out across the states, for example, then you will see that there will be three sets of components. And they will communicate between those components quite intensely and they will communicate less intensely across those groups. And basically this is where, when I saw this, I say, yeah, this is, the, this is what basically triggered me. I saw something that didn't make sense because I saw a lot of 
individual microservices, but I saw only two teams. Uh, well, why are there so many more services? And the answer is, well, they were preparing for the eventuality that they would grow much bigger. Uh, but you have to pay all the, all the way. So basically, this is what Conway says, and it, it holds up uh, across a variety of, of domains. But the thing that became clear to me is, this is not just about when you have software development spread out across locations or uh, even time zones. It's also if you have multiple teams, even in the same building, then you will see those teams will have their own uh, deployment rhythm, for example. So they will, for example, follow Scrum. They will just deploy whatever they are building uh, every sprint. Um, so the advantages of having separate services that you can, you know, update and deploy individually, it's basically not really um, something that you that you benefit from if you only have a single team. You're still going to do the things in the same rhythm. So, and this is uh, what Conway's law looks like, and uh, you can see Martin Fowler, uh, who I quoted in this uh, Conway's law. But the thing is, how does this relate to microservices and modular monolith? And Mr. Fowler already had also an article about that. So this was again after I actually applied the law and found the solution, but I found it uh, amusing to see that it was actually a known uh, thing. So basically what Mr. Fowler says is uh, microservices are really a tool to structure your development organization. And this clicked with me. I said, yeah, given what I can do with Orleans, I can see that if I, for some reason, uh, my team grows too big, or the complexity grows too big to, to handle in a single team, I might want to add another team. Okay, and then I want to have them to have an independent deployment rhythm. And then I want to split it into a separate microservice. So basically what this all boils down to is that microservices should have the similar decomposition as your team's organization. That's when it makes the most sense. And even then, they say, and I sort of tend to agree with this, that if you start a new project, even if you're absolutely sure it will become big enough to really need many more, many teams, you shouldn't start it. And the reason for that is that boundaries are hard to discover, stable boundaries. So this is something that really helps you um, make your decisions to say, okay, I think these are the, the boundaries when I start with the system, but you know, you are a lot more sure that if you've actually had uh, some time to, to build and evolve that solution, what your boundaries really are. And the thing is, if you do a monolith, and let's say a monolith, for example, take a very simple, let's say a monolith is just an executable, and it has several namespaces in them. So the modules are the namespaces then, in that example. You can understand that it's much easier to refactor something from one namespace to the other or define new namespaces, that it has a very low friction between the boundary type that is namespace when you compare it to the friction for the boundary type that is a network addressable service, a microservice. So this is all about keeping the type of boundaries that you have early on have a very low cost of, of uh, change. And then when you're a bit more sure and you say, okay, we need more teams and we're going to break out some of those logical services to separate teams, then at least your boundaries have firmed up and you don't have a lot of expensive changes across service boundaries. So that's basically, the whole thinking and, and the reason I'm, I'm spending some time on this is that I have found well quite a number of teams that just thought, well, microservices seems a good solution from a technical point of view, but it didn't take into account uh, that they were only a single team or only two teams and they didn't decide 
to actually create more teams if they want more microservices. So um, this is just a, some, some signal for everybody who is in that situation to, to realize that you develop the two together and you don't have to do it uh, up front. Okay. So, and when I go back, I'm not sure. Yeah, I didn't mention this. I'm sorry about that. But there are basically three responses to this Conway law. So the first one is ignore. So this is what the first two teams did in my example. The, the, the middle one is accept. So basically say, okay, we have this organization. I'm going to mold the architecture so it doesn't conflict with the development organization. And that's basically what I did. That was my realization when I saw this law. But then there's something that's even more powerful, and that's called the inverse Conway maneuver. And that's basically when you say, okay, we are not just building, decomposing the system and evolving that decomposition. While we are doing that, we are also building and decomposing the development organization together in small steps with you know, quick feedback loops. And that's the, what's called the inverse Conway maneuver. And that's the most powerful uh, response that you can have. OK. So that's, uh, I'm thinking it's about uh, time to move towards demo, <laughs> perhaps. All you guys still awake? Yes? <laughs> yes, for sure. Have you got any questions? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, this was all conceptual, right? So I'm now getting to the, to the bits and bytes and to the, the stuff where I'm really, no, I love, I'm, all, I'm always, my idea is I go hands on and from hands on I go to the, uh, to the concepts. But uh, sure, I before, before we transition real quick, there is a yeah. question here from Philip. Um, they're saying, isn't Orleans a distributed monolith? So who owns the silo infrastructure and is that part of the infrastructure? So I think they're kind of riffing on um, the, the, the argument for what you're proposing here, which is Orleans dot multi-service well it's not a uh, so the, the the structure that you're talking about here is the silos but the silos are like a a resource uh, composition like a, a container for example it's not a logical or functional uh, composition so you can't, when you're talking about uh, uh, a modular monolith, the concept of module uh, has to do with splitting up functionality, right? Which is what services are also about. So it doesn't really apply at that level. Perfect. Ruben, did you, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, yeah, you can, you can use Orleans to build something which is a fully you know, decomposed microservice type architecture or you can use it to build something which is more monolithic in style. Um, and you can choose, uh, th there's a spectrum between these things and you can move along that spectrum later as you see fit. You know, you can you can move a grain class from one silo to another if you have different roles, for example. Let's say you've got a, a back-end processing silo role and a, a front-end role or whatever it is. Maybe you've got a basket service as a, as a separate role. You can choose later to decompose these things into from a modular monolith into individual microservices and kind of remix that on the fly or later. Uh, and, and the point there being, and, and a lot of this comes down to what Vincent was saying about um, this journey to from a modular monolith towards microservices, you can defer a lot of that architectural decision. You, you don't have to front load all of the pain in this anticipation that one day we're going to be a you know, a Fortune 500 mega corp, and we're going to have an entire division devoted to the basket service, for example, um, which which I think is a very powerful thing. The idea that you don't have to front load the pain, you don't have to pre-architect for you know the, um, the 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 larger scale which you would ever anticipate in this service. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, so. Uh... At the end of, of my learning, uh, and in the last year, uh, I, I sort of updated and made that uh, into a, a shared library. Uh, the uh, link is at the bottom of the slide. So I called it Orleans Multiservice. But basically, it's, it's uh, the pattern that I described for having multiple logical services in one physical service and using Orleans for that. Um, uh, with um, 
well, basically how to separate those things in a way that it won't cost you any rewrites um, when you actually want to move a logical service out to a different team, to a different microservice. So basically I decided, well, I'm going to prove this uh, in the repo as well. So I added an example of, an, uh, of a web shop and I built it two times. First, well, I showed basically two lifetime stages. So first I built uh, the whole web shop with a single team and also in a single audience multi-service but it does have two logical services inside of it. And that's called a basket and a catalog service. So two logical services. And one of those services calls the other. So the basket service has, as you can see in the screenshot here, uh, uh, a client for the catalog service. So there's a dependency there. And what I wanted to prove was that, okay, let's say you are like two years down the road, and um, you really are ready to, to shift some of this to a separate team. And let's say that it is uh, the catalog service. You want to move out to a new team. So I call that uh, team B. So there's team A and team B. And then you can see basically here in the diagram what changes. So you can see team A uh, on the left has both services, team B is a new solution and also a new service and has a single logical service, which is the catalog service. And then on the right side, you see team A uh, when it's in a two team context and it only has a single service left at that moment, which is the basket. Um, and then you see from the arrows, how things move from one to the other. So you can see that what's actually moved is basically just folders folders with source in the structure. Um, and the way that the dependency changes, that's the blue arrow on the uh, right bottom, dependency in a single team is just grains calling each other through grains interfaces. So just an internal Orleans mechanism, no overhead whatsoever. And that changes to the blue arrow in the middle of the screen where you can see the same client grain but now it calls uh, through HTTP client, a traditional REST API, which is now uh, moved to a, a physical different service. So you see that you also avoid any of the network call overhead because you are doing this between grains. And one of the powerful things of Orleans is it is fully network addressable, but if you are having, um, for example, shared hosting and you have grains that live in the same silo, then you, do, you can actually avoid going through the network stack altogether, depending on how you configure the grains. So in addition to just having um, a lot less overhead and a lot less friction to change while you are still in the left-hand situation, it's also uh, a performance boost. So that's uh, what I would like to do is show how this works because the whole point of the library is to make this easy and to prove it. That's the second point. And what you see uh, down below in the middle is uh, two, uh, two command line statements. So one is a .NET new uh, template statement. It's called MCS Orleans Multiservice. And the other one, once you've instantiated that template, you get a solution uh, like on the left hand side. It includes, uh, it generates a script to add more logical services in the same solution. So you can expand your solution really quickly. And then later on, you can move it out. The moving out is just copying folders and creating a new solution. Uh, but that's basically uh, the promise of this uh, library at this point. Um, if there's no question at this point, I will go to Visual Studio and show how it's done. Sounds like a plan? Yeah, yeah let's do that. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, while you're transitioning over, I was just thinking to myself, like, I wonder how many of our viewers um, have have come across, you know, in, in their development careers, you know, a monolith like this or microservice architectures and you know, you know, light bulbs are going off and they're saying, oh, this is really clever. I like what you've done here. And 
because I, I've certainly, you know, before joining Microsoft, I've, I've done consulting and stuff, and uh, I could see this being very applicable in, in many different use cases. So this is great. Okay, thanks. So, uh, well, the steps, I'm just following the, like the README in the, in the uh, Orleans uh, multi-surface on GitHub, and it's, it's really simple. So you just have to make sure that uh, templates are installed. That's, that's just one, uh, just one single command. It's called modern C-sharp template. So there's more stuff in there for Lint and other stuff as well. But basically it's in, in this scenario, we are interested in this, uh, this single template. Now this template has quite a lot of uh, configuration options and you can, you can see what they are by just asking what the parameters are. And the first bunch is just standard stuff that all the .NET 2 templates have. But the last three ones are the ones that I specifically built in. So when you want to create a new multi-service, you have to specify uh, three names, basically. So a prefix for the, for the namespace. Uh, so um, consider using, uh, well, the Microsoft standard, basically, .NET standard, so company product technology. It's a prefix for all the, all the namespaces everywhere. The second one is basically the name of the multi-service itself. So you can think of it as the solution name, but it's also uh, uh, part of other names in the template. And uh, there's been put quite a lot of, of work in uh, making sure that you don't get any inconvenient uh, ambiguities with these names. So the whole template sort of um, make sure that you as a developer um, don't have to don't have to unambiguous names that are similar or that clash or that are not relevant but the end result is you just give it a root namespace you give it uh, a name for for example you can you can even uh, give it uh, a team name suffix and that's that's when you are into the modus of saying, okay, in essence, we're starting with one of these for each team and we're not going to split within the same team. Of course, there's always unless, but that's that's how you could start with it. Okay, and then the, the last one is basically the real, you know, the functional service that you want to start with. So for example, a basket or uh, a product or something like that. So this is just really a container name for the multi -shares. Well, let's say we're actually going to do that. And we're just going to say, OK, let's not make it in the default example. But let's say that this is uh, uh, live, perhaps. Yeah. So you can see I, I'm, I'm using a team name uh, here. and. Uh, the logical service that I'm trying to create here, or actually going to create, is uh, catalog. Now, let's just do that. And as you can see, where we were in the eShop folder, and it's now uh, populated with the instance of, uh, of this solution. So let's just say, open that. Generated solution. And you didn't have any files before there, right? No, true. I can do it again if you want to. No, no. <laughs> just, yeah. just confirm me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was waiting, but it was actually already there. So what you can see here, I have a solution and team A. So these are basically, you know, the, the, the services that are the responsibility of team A. And in the APIs, I have a folder for the API of catalog. And I have a catalog service. This, this is the implementation of the catalog that contains the grain implementation. And then I have a single contracts project with a folder again for the catalog contract. So what you basically see is that the logical service is defined here in terms of a grain interface with some DTOs in their catalog item. I love that you're using records. Thank you for that. Yes, yes, I actually pestered uh, uh, Robin when they were going to wash 
for Lean 7 on fully supporting uh, records. And he did. And I was very happy about it. I, I bothered him too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, and uh, well, of course, and then you have, uh, you have, you know, uh, I, I chose for, so I didn't choose for minimal APIs here uh, because that's more suited to the single service logic within a physical service. And this is, so you, there, there's a matter of taste and you could use either, but uh, I, I chose controls because it sort of gives you a ready to go structure when you have many of these things. Um, so you don't have to create the, the conventions of uh, how to structure that, but it's, you can have both. But basically I generated this and uh, it was just a single, uh, a single command to generate this solution. Let me quickly uh, run it and uh, show that it actually works. So we have a catalog service. You can execute it and it will give you some items back that are in the catalog. Now, okay, let's say that I would like to add something more. You can see it generates a readme with the exact command that was used to generate this solution. You have to take into account that it can be quite a while before more services are added. So People working then uh, are, are helped with just, you know, having uh, documented how it was actually created. So the template does that as well. And there's a, a, a script here and you can just use the built-in PowerShell prompt and just say, okay, I want to add a logical service and we already have the catalog. So let's add the basket service. It says, okay, reload, and then you have a basket API edit, and you have a, a basket service edit, and you have a basket contract edit, and uh, the things that go between them. So you can see it very quickly to, to do this. Uh, let me just, uh, I'm not sure why this is all an error, but okay, let's do a product. Okay, so this is how quickly you can do that. And uh, well, of course, it always doesn't work in the uh, in the demo, <laughs> but usually <laughs> it just compiles. <laughs> so let me quickly see if there's anything else there. Yeah, okay, so that's just a rebuild logic. There wow, we go. That, demo gods. That's cool. <laughs> it's all yeah, coming so, together now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so this is this is the left hand side of the picture I showed, right? This is creating a modular uh, modular uh, monolith with Orleans that you can deploy into a single service or a microservice, whatever you want. So, okay, so this is the part of creating the the, the start situation, but we still have left a bit of proof. Um, so I'm going to close this and the proof is, of course, how is it actually going to work when you do that split? So what I have here is the, this is actually an example that's in the repo as well. So this is the example of a single team. And I want, so the whole premise is it's not a lot of work. It's actually very little work to pull out these uh, micro, these logical services into a physical separate service. That's the whole premise of this thing. So I actually did that. And um, here you see the single team solution. And the key thing, of course, when you pull out a logical service is what's going to happen? What code do you need to change? For example, when you have dependencies. So this basket service has a catalog service client grain. And uh, it, it asks the catalog service, when you are filling a basket, it asks the catalog service to update the product information. For example, if the price was changed or something is out of stock, then it will update the basket to reflect that. So that's a well, um, regular logic. But the thing is, this uh, catalog service client grain in the situation where you're not split up, it's just a regular grain. It's a stateless worker, so it can scale out if you have many concurrent accesses, right? Um, but basically what it does, you can see those two bookmarks here. It just gets grain and it calls a method on the grain. So that's the situation where your 
talking between logical services. They, these are just grain calls, nothing special about them in the audience context. So what happens when we do this in, we had a second team, so team B, which now has the catalog, catalog API. And we also have team A in the new situation where the thing is moved out. We are still having the same grain and we are still having the same interface. And the only two lines that are changing is, look, this catalog has a client. And this is a client that's actually generated from the open API spec of the service. So it's not manually coded in this, uh, in this situation. So basically what I'm saying is there are two lines of difference when you are moving out a service with a dependency. That's all, all there is, just having a, and of course I still have to prove that it works. So uh, let me do that. So I'm starting the split situation here. And I have to start. So the two teams are now deploying and starting in a manner of speaking. So I'm, I'm going to start team V as well. Okay. So let me show. So team B, team A. Uh, one has the catalog, the other has the basket. Right, and uh, if you can see in the, let me show the code quickly. It's quick and dirty here, so it's just, it has the URL in there. It's just for demo purposes, but you can see that's actually where it's running here, 5113. So the dependency goes from the basket to the eShop. And uh, let me just uh, put some uh, products here in the catalog so the basket can be updated. So let's just say product one. Oh, bro. why did I type that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So let's say this is this costs uh, 12 and uh, well, well, let's just keep it at that. I'll just post it. It's, so we only have a single, it's called product one, it costs 12. I'll post it. And uh, oh, I don't need to, sorry. I did that wrong. Execute. To execute it, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so, and it uh, responded with the ID of the created item. So then I'm going to create a basket. Uh, the basket here is, uh, and it contains, and I'm not going to edit this unit price or this product name because those are the ones that are here. So basically, let's just say I want three of them and just say execute its uh, product ID zero. And at this point, it will return and you will see the response. So even though I sent this into the service, it has contacted the other service and said, look, this is unit price 12 and product name one, and quantity is three. So QED, uh, it works. <laughs> Very trivial, but uh, yeah, but basically what you're looking at then is um, I'm going to do all that uh, just to, to demonstrate the whole point of this presentation, which is look at the difference, find the difference. I'm, I'm switching, I'm switching between before and after move out. The only it's code very is hard to see, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just two lines. It's just two lines. That's and awesome. that's the whole point. So uh, I've probably uh, forgotten to mention a bunch of things, but I see we're coming up <laughs> on time. Yeah. So <laughs> I didn't look at the, at the at the clock at all. So, but basically, there you have it. Perfectly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it went so, perfectly. So that's that's great. <laughs> yeah. So the only uh, URL that you need is the one that's at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the readme of that uh, repo on GitHub contains all the other things that I show. Even uh, the video of the Orleans meetup where I described the earlier case uh, in more detail for people who were interested. So, Awesome. Um, 
Thank you. That that was great, Vincent. Uh, I personally learned a lot uh, with the show today, and I I was amazed at how easy it was to create this microservices um, um, project with with Orleans um, a multi service, not just not just one. So like, it doesn't take six months <laughs> to show email address, like Philip was saying. <laughs> so thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, Next on our schedule, we have um, we're returning Monday, April 24th, unless someone submits a show before. But we have Bertrand Leroy on the on the schedule to cover Lunar Core, a simple search for all .NET apps. Um, and then I think David will run our our link as well for you to submit and and submit your show. We welcome you as a guest as well. Come share your knowledge and your projects with us. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, until next time. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Friends. Thank you, Vincent. Bye.